Coming up on this Tuesday edition of Newsline at Noon, the hottest issue in this week's parliamentary audit is whether there was external political pressure over the prosecution's probe into alleged election meddling by the National Intelligence Service. As China expands its military might, the U.S. is getting ready to deploy its biggest and most advanced stealth Navy destroyer in the Pacific. Plus, U.S. President Barack Obama tries to ease Paris's concerns about Washington's reported surveillance of French citizens. French President Francois Hollande says such activity between allies is unacceptable. These stories and more on Newsline at Noon. Where's the best place for beef and bop? Les Jeux Olympiques d'hiver se dérouleront-ils à Pyeongchang? هل أنتم حقا سابع أكبر مصدر في العالم؟ Korea is attracting interest from around the world. The more you know, the more you want to know. Dynamic Korea. Thanks for joining us. You're watching Newsline at Noon. I'm Chi Yuzan in Seoul. Very good to have you with us. I'm Mark Broom. We kick things off with the political scandal that refuses to go away. The lead prosecutor investigating the spy agency's alleged meddling in the 2012 presidential election, who was removed from the case last week, has said there was outside pressure undermining the probe from the get-go. His boss, however, disputes the argument and on Tuesday asked the Supreme Prosecutor's Office to carry out an investigation into himself. Our Kim Hyun-ji reports. Prosecutor Yoon sung yeol who headed a special probe into allegations that the National Intelligence Service attempted to influence last year's presidential election, was removed from the task force investigating the case last Friday. The Seoul Central District Prosecutor's Office says that Yoon was expelled for overseeing raids on the homes of four NIS officials and detaining three of them without permission from his superiors. However, Yoon said at a parliamentary audit Monday that he did report his plan to his superior, Cho young gun the chief of the Seoul office. Specifically, Yoon said he visited Cho's house on the night of October 15th to discuss adding a new charge to the indictment of former spy agency chief Won se hoon a highly sensitive decision. Won was indicted in June and is currently on trial for allegations that he ordered NIS agents to post negative comments on the Internet against Democratic Party candidate Moon Jae-in in the run-up to the presidential election last year. Yoon says his team found evidence that the spy agency also used Twitter for a smear campaign against Moon and independent candidate An Chol Su. He said the evidence had been discovered through raids and questioning the NIS officials. The superiors are supposed to help the investigation move forward, but they kept nitpicking at smaller details. I know that is necessary, but if the people who are investigating the case feel it wasn't fair and crossed the line, then we can only regard it as external political pressure. However, Yoon's superior Cho argued Yoon never officially asked for his authorization. Reporting is a crucial part of the decision-making process, and I felt that Yoon's way of reporting this wasn't proper. I just told him I would consider his plan. The prosecution is currently investigating whether Yoon failed to comply with procedure. It will make a final decision by October 30th on whether to accept the results of Yoon's investigation and add it to the indictment of the former spy agency director. Kim hyun Arirang News. We are getting reports now that Kil Tae-gi, the acting prosecutor general, has ordered an inspection into the apparent internal, internal conflict between the election probe team and its superiors. 
The mother of Kenneth Bae, a U.S. missionary detained in North Korea, has pleaded with Pyongyang to show her son mercy and send him home. In an exclusive interview with CNN, Pae Myung-hee, who recently visited her ailing son at a hospital in the north, said her son had a strong Christian faith and had always wanted to help North Korea and its people. She added her son's way of conveying his beliefs eventually conflicted with the North Korean regime, an atheist country that bans missionary activities. She said her son misunderstood their system and has now realized a lot of things, including that he did do some harm to the country. Kenneth Bae was sentenced to 15 years in a North Korean labor camp earlier this year for what the regime called hostile acts. South Koreans have been warned against downloading online gaming programs as the police here in the South say they could have been developed by North Korea to launch cyber attacks on the South. The National Police Agency said Tuesday that gaming programs developed by North Korea have been distributed in South Korea. Um, it says the malware they contain can collect location data and IP addresses and send them to servers overseas. Infected PCs can then be used to launch distributed denial of service or DDoS attacks. Police advise the public refrain from downloading uncertified gaming programs and to back up data and format the hard drive if you suspect your PC has been infected with malware. The Korean government has singled out the biotech and biomedical industries as a new growth engine for Korea, and it's already invested millions of dollars building a new complex south of Seoul just to get things started. Now, Jim Young Gil reports. New medicines, cutting edge medical devices, and medical research and development. These are just a few of the areas the Korean government plans to focus over the next 10 years to keep the country on the cutting edge of the biotech industry and drive economic development. To get things started, the government is building a domestic complex called Osong Bio Valley that combines facilities for the biotech and biomedical industries, universities, research institutes and government organizations. The complex located in Chungcheong province is expected to cost $4 billion and will be finished in 2038. The biggest investment thus far has come from biopharmaceutical companies at 53.3 percent. Korea's Deputy Prime Minister and Finance Minister Hyun Oseok paid a visit to the complex on Monday. He toured Meter Biomed, which develops dentistry and surgical products, and met with other business leaders with facilities in the complex. The minister stressed that the biomedical industry is full of potential with projected earnings of 4 trillion U.S. dollars over the next 10 years. He promised to improve regulations, increase R&D capacity and nurture human capital. The complex is part of a third round of government measures designed to boost investment in the biomedical sector. And a fourth round will be announced in December. Jim young Arirang News. Korean exports to Japan are being hit hard by Tokyo's so-called Abenomics stimulus policies, which are weakening the Japanese yen. The Korea International Trade Association said Tuesday that Korea's outbound shipments to Japan dropped by more than 13 percent in August compared to the same month last year. Exports to Japan have now been falling for seven straight months. Further highlighting the contraction, the report shows Korea's exports to Japan in August accounted for less than 6% of Korea's total exports. The same figure was at nearly 8% at the start of the year. Foreign ownership of Korean stocks has hit a six-year high amid a record-long buying spree by foreign investors, raising expectations of a brighter outlook for the local bourse. New data from the Korea Exchange shows overseas investors held nearly one-third of the stock traded on the benchmark KOSPI and the secondary KOSDAQ last Friday, worth roughly 412 billion U.S. dollars. This is the highest proportion since 2007, when foreign ownership accounted for 33.2 percent of Korean shares. Now, with rising life expectancy rates here in Korea, you may think most Koreans are looking forward to a long and relatively comfortable retirement. But a recent report paints a vastly different picture of the elderly, who are far less happy than the nation's young people. Paul Lee reports. 
A quick survey of people here at this busy transit station in Korea shows that most believe life is treating them well. Yes, I got married and also got a new job. Life's pretty good. Yes, I can say I'm happy. Things are all right in my life. But just how happy are Koreans these days? A nationwide survey by Hyundai Research Institute conducted earlier this month sought to answer that very question, and 41.5 percent of the some 1,000 respondents said they were happy. When asked what particular factors contributed to their happiness, a majority of Korean men and women said their interpersonal relationships. Good health and satisfaction with their jobs also made the list. But those results go both ways. Survey takers also found that interpersonal relationships and work-related issues were some of the most stressful factors in life. Economic problems and a lack of leisure time were the top reasons for feeling unhappy. Respondents in their 20s showed to be the happiest age group, with similar figures for those in their 30s, 40s, and 50s. However, the average level of happiness drops sharply for those 60 years and older. The declining trend of happiness with age stands in contrast to most other industrialized countries like Switzerland, where senior citizens are generally the happiest demographic. Researchers say the problem is due in part to sharp cuts in disposable income after retirement. For those 60 years old and older, the public pension enrollment rate is only 15 percent. That's a large difference compared to other generations. Coupled with a lack of preparation for older age and the rise in single households, these trends have been lowering the level of happiness. The survey results show an ever-growing need for a wider social net for elderly Koreans to ensure that the silver generation can feel confident that the best years of their lives are still ahead of them. Paul Yi, Arirang News. For your fill of Korean and international news, join Che Yu Sun and Mark Broom every weekday at lunchtime. Newsline at noon. session this Wednesday and vote on the government restructuring bills. It's the largest Navy destroyer the U.S. has ever built, and it's ready for launch. The first in-class stealth destroyer will be deployed to the Pacific Ocean next year, a move seen by many as a way for the U.S. to keep both China and North Korea in check. Our defense ministry correspondent Han Dan reports. This is a Zumwalt class destroyer, America's next generation Navy destroyer. After a bit of a delay due to the federal government shutdown, the destroyer is set to be launched this week and will be deployed to the Pacific Ocean next year. At more than 180 meters long, some 30 meters longer than pre existing destroyers, and nearly 25 meters wide, the Zumwalt is the largest Navy destroyer the U.S. has ever built. As its sleek silhouette suggests, the most notable feature of the Zumwalt is its stealth feature, which keeps the ship from being detected by enemy radar. The Zumwalt has the capacity to load one MH-60R or an SH-60 LAMPS helicopter and three unmanned aerial vehicles, and comes armed with long-range subsonic Tomahawk missiles and vertical launch anti-submarine rockets and other weaponry. Often referred to as an aircraft carrier killer, the destroyer is also equipped with an advanced railgun system that has a range of 160 kilometers. Many weapons experts see the destroyer's launch as a move to counter China's growing naval influence in the Asia-Pacific region, and there's no doubt it's already attracted the attention of the Chinese government. The high-tech destroyer is also expected to help the U.S. keep tabs on North Korea, which has continued to threaten regional security with its nuclear and missile programs. Han Dan, Arirang News. U.S. President Barack Obama has spoken to French President Francois Hollande about press reports disclosing alleged large-scale American spying on French citizens. Paris is demanding Washington give an explanation about and a justification for its spying activities. Our Kim Hyun Bin reports. U.S. President Barack Obama has called French President Francois Hollande over reported aggressive surveillance of French citizens by the National Security Agency. 
The White House says Obama told Elon the U.S. is reviewing its intelligence gathering to ensure a balance between security and privacy. Both leaders also agreed they should continue diplomatic discussions about the issue. The call came after French Daily Le Monde reported that NSA eavesdropped on over 70 million phone calls in just under a month between December 2012 and January 2013. Earlier Monday, France summoned U.S. Ambassador Charles Rifkin to provide prompt clarifications and justifications for the alleged spying. The information published by Le Monde newspaper states practices that are unacceptable. We have an extremely useful cooperation with the United States to fight terrorism. But this cooperation cannot justify everything. Therefore, we are asking the United States for prompt clarification, explanations and justifications. Le Monde says the main targets appear to be individuals suspected of terrorism. But French politicians and businesses were also on the list. Through the secret prism and upstream programs, the surveillance and spying goes beyond the constant and official justification of the fight against terrorism. When reports first surfaced, criticism in France was fairly muted due to the start of U.S.-EU free trade talks in July. But it now appears the Obama administration will have its work cut out justifying the NSA's alleged actions. Kim Hyun-bin, Arirai News. The United States is also attempting to placate Saudi Arabia, which is furious over what it sees as inaction over the civil war in Syria and Iran's alleged nuclear weapons program. In a rare display of anger last Friday, Saudi Arabia turned down a coveted two-year term on the UN Security Council, accusing the United Nations of double standards in its dealings with different Arab nations. At a lunch meeting in Paris Monday, US Secretary of State John Kerry tried to convince the Saudi Foreign Minister that Washington and Riyadh share the same goals of a nuclear-free Iran, an end to Syria's civil war and a stable Egypt. Saudi Arabia is angry the U.S. dropped plans for airstrikes against Syria and appears close to striking a deal with Iran over its nuclear program, but slashed aid to Egypt following its crackdown on anti-interim government protesters. Syrian President Bashar al-Assad says he has no idea when an international conference on ending the civil war in his country will happen and has even cast doubt on the effectiveness if it does take place. Out of all the obstacles in the way of a diplomatic solution, one of the largest is Assad's unwillingness to step down to make way for a transitional government. Speaking to a Syrian TV network on Monday, Assad says he expects to run in the presidential election set for next year. The Arab League said Sunday that the peace conference known as Geneva II was scheduled for November 23rd, but Assad reiterated no date has been set. There has been yet another shooting at a school in the United States. On this occasion, a teacher has been killed and two students severely injured. The shooter, a 12-year-old boy, then turned the gun on himself. Our Kim min has the details. Dozens of police cars surround the grounds of this Nevada school as armed policemen storm into the premises. Officials say a 12-year-old student who has not been identified opened fire using a semi-automatic handgun at Sparks Middle School just before classes were due to start on Monday. The boy killed a teacher and injured two of his fellow students before taking his own life. The student shot the teacher identified as 45-year-old Michael Lansbury, who was trying to stop him shooting other students. Five shots, just pops, just like a, you hear it from a distance, gunshot. And it sounded like from the back of the school. Of the two injured students, one was shot in the shoulder and the other in the abdomen. Police say one student is out of surgery and the other is doing well. I will confirm that there are two deceased and two individuals injured. I want to emphasize that the students are safe. The governor of Nevada, Brian Sandoval, said he was deeply saddened by the horrific shooting and sent his condolences. Students at the school were evacuated to a nearby high school and classes were canceled. Investigations are ongoing, but it's yet unknown what drove such a young child to commit such a terrible crime. Kim Minji, Arirang News. Japan's Environment Ministry was forced to acknowledge Monday that the decontamination of six towns around the stricken Fukushima nuclear plant will have to be delayed by up to three years. 
The cleanup was originally due to be complete by next March, but has been pushed back mostly due to lack of storage for contaminated cooling water from damaged reactors. The Fukushima plant has been hit by continuous toxic leaks, with the latest reported on Sunday after heavy rainfall in the nation. The plant's operator TEPCO said the toxic isotope strontium-90 overflowed from containment barriers around water tanks at the plant. The ministry's announcement means more than 90,000 people won't be able to return home until 2017. And on a lighter note, as more movies are made into 3D, many movie fans are complaining of dizziness and also just the hassle of wearing those plastic glasses. If you're one of those people, this report will be of interest as local developers have come up with a new way to enjoy the latest blockbusters. Our Sun Jung In reports. This futuristic movie screen has a panoramic 270-degree view which spreads from the front all the way to both sides, filling your range of vision completely. Using the side walls of theaters as additional screens, this three-screen format allows viewers to feel they're actually inside the film. We shot the same scene simultaneously using three cameras from different angles to create 270-degree coverage. Therefore, it gives you an immersive experience similar to watching 3D movies. It's winning rave reviews from viewers, as it does not require 3D glasses, nor does it make you dizzy or queasy like with some 3D screens. For the first time ever, local cinema chain CJCGV and public research university KAIS have introduced this new 270-degree screen with multi-projection technology. Experts expect the market to grow and gain popularity as it costs a lot less than high-priced 3D screens. We plan to approach diverse overseas markets starting with the United States, Malaysia and Indonesia. The three-side screen has already been installed at 22 theaters nationwide, with more to follow later this year. Son Jung-in, Arirang News. Time now to get a weather update on this beautiful afternoon with our Yi Ji Hyun standing by at the Weather Center. Hello to you, Ji Hyun. Good afternoon, Mark and Yuza. Now, do you guys remember hearing that the number of foreign tourists to Jeju Island had reached 2 million? Hmm. 2 million, yes. I believe I, I heard that last uh, week, and mm -hmm. I'm sure you know, visiting Jeju at any time of the year is really nice, but at this time when the weather is so fantastic, it must be even better. Right, I agree. And by the way, those 79% uh, of those tourists were from China. Also, the number of domestic tourists increased this month as well. And it's been said that tourist number will peak this weekend with people traveling to Jeju to enjoy the fall foliage. But don't be disappointed if you can't get to Jeju. Most regions will continue to enjoy fine autumn weather for the next couple of days. And even for today, afternoon highs will soar to the low 20s in most regions. And we have high pressure system uh, continuing to dominate the nation, giving us a lot of sunshine. Now, we do still need to be mindful of the big temperature swings between day and at night, which is one of the things that cause people to get sick between seasons. So please take a good care of yourself. Now tomorrow we have another mild day in store with temperatures in the low 20s, just like today. Uh, then we'll have a short cold spell later in the week and that will uh, stay out with us till the weekend. Now November is getting close, so we'll start to see temperatures drop gradually in the coming weeks. But not today, it's stunning outside. So let's take a closer look 
at the readings for today. At the afternoon highs in Seoul and Busan will get up to 22 degrees Celsius, which is 72 degrees in Fahrenheit. And Daegu and Gwangju will make it to 21 and 23 respectively. Now let's see how other regions are looking. It looks like high in Jeju and Daejeon should be similar at 21 to 22 degrees, while Tokdo will get up to 15 and Mount Kumgang will stay on the cooler side at 8 degrees. Now that's all for Korea, and here's the global forecast for viewers around the world. That's all for me today. Enjoy your lunch break and hope you have a great rest of the day. Now, back to you guys in the studio. Thank you very much, Gion, for the weather report there. And that's pretty much all from us. And as I keep reminding you, you can always check up on what's been happening in Korea, but also around the world on our website, arirang.co.kr forward slash news. We'll be back tomorrow at the same time, but uh, do stay with Arirang TV for more on the day's headlines.